Hello everyone, today we talk about the 6th century Byzantine cavalry battle formations. So this is uh, part of the series uh, battle formations videos, um, which means that I do not talk specifically uh, about the tactics in this case of the 6th century Byzantine cavalry, but rather how the um, the cavalry, and I would say in certain cases is even the army proper, because at this time the Byzantine armies were uh, largely mounted, uh, were in fact uh, deployed uh, information um, for for battle, of course, because there, there are also the, the march formations, but today we do not see that, and we, we look at something else. So, um, what else? Um, yeah, let's get immediately started. So, um, as I was saying just right now, by the 6th century, the Byzantine cavalry uh, was really increasing I uh, its importance. Um, you know that we, we are in... in, in I, I talked about it also recently in the in video about the Battle of Mammes, that is in fact in 534. Uh, you know, the importance that cavalry had um, um, in, in this migration era uh, a bit in, in the whole um, Euro European continent and the uh, Mediterranean as well, by influence uh, essentially of, of these um, chiefly populations of the steppes, but not only, hmm? um, as uh, you know, the cavalry increased its importance uh, since um, uh, even in the same Roman Empire, internally speaking, uh, and also in other peoples. Um, uh, by um, for, for certain political and social reasons uh, from roughly we can't say even the second century AD normally it's, it's said well it started with the third century yeah but um, it's already from from the um, the 80s of the second century that we think that especially with the Marcomannic Wars and other incursions along the limits the Romans started to augment the um, the cavalry uh, units in, in their army. Excuse me, I drink a little. <laughs> so this process had gone on, um, we can say uh, uninterruptedly. The Romans had developed um, different types of cavalry, of Roman cavalry proper, because you know that originally speaking I'd say at the times of Augustus, the Romans had a very few cavalry. Mm. Uh, not a bad one, but a, a really a few, and they preferred to uh, rely on foreign cavalries um, for uh, for that particular uh, role. Um, so, with the late empire, there is a progressive, um, cent um, let's say, centralization, even of the, um, not just of the uh, state, of the administration, but also of the army, uh, <coughs> in terms of um, weapon reproduction, uh, training, barracks, I mean, um, the, the empire, especially with the um, barbarian invasions, tends to uh, centralize everything, uh, a bit differently from how it was before. Also from a strictly geographical point of view, what was before along the so-called Limes uh, now was not that safe anymore, so... Um, many of the uh, training centers and of the um, um, uh, armories begin to be um, uh, built into the, uh, say, uh, along the Mediterranean proper, the, 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 the very core of the empire. So um, by the 6th century especially, uh, the Romans had integrated very large components of, uh, of cavalry from foreign peoples. Um, during the 6th century, if you take the army of Belisarius, for instance, you realize that it was an almost mount, uh, all mounted army. Yes, of course, infantry was important, but it, it, it was really the, the cavalry that played a, as a spearhead of the army, and um, <coughs> it, was, um, it had a very high uh, military quality. Mm, by the way, uh, it was made up both by bi um, Roman soldiers and foreigners, as we were saying. And uh, among these foreigners, there were mm, extremely uh, skilled uh, horsemen, like the Huns, like uh, the Longobards. Um, I mean, peoples who had received a, a lot of influence from from the steppes, and and, and the same Byzantines, especially, uh, you know, stressing uh, the, the their eastern character. Uh, they were living indeed um, 
a bit differently from what had been the Western Roman Empire uh, at closer contact with the uh, horse riding peoples. Hmm? They were just across, I mean, the Danube uh, and also in, into uh, the Near East. So um, Constantinople absorbed these influences and was able to mm, to um, to re to relab to integrate them and to reelaborate them so that the Byzantine cavalry proper, the Roman cavalry proper at this time, was um, extremely extremely um, good and especially very functional mm -hmm. because the Romans had had some. Um, the some trouble, <laughs> initially speaking, we can say, in, uh, in cr replicating um, good calories on their own, like the ones of the peoples in the steppes. By the 6th century, you realize from, from all the uh, uh, material available here, historical sources, military manuals, for instance, uh, and also lots of other evidence, that the Byzantine, Byzantine cavalry was extremely uh, efficient, extremely uh, well trained, extremely well equipped, um, the Byzantine cavalryman was um, uh, underwent a, an extremely long training. Mm. Uh, it basically had training for all its life. It was, um, uh, he was uh, capable of fighting uh, in every kind of situation mm, with every kind of weapon. So this added very much to the flexibility of, of the same um, soldier that he could fight both as a uh, prevalently as, as a horseman but also on foot and with a uh, bow and arrows and lance, a sword, axes and all. So um, this is something telling you truth that you find also in other populations. At this time uh, people like the longer birds for instance were um, almost equal to the Byzantines if n from uh, an individual in terms of individual equipment and, and skills and all. Mm. The only difference is that the Roman state could give a discipline and a collective training that these other peoples out there uh, lacked because they lacked uh, centralization from their side. So uh, this meant that Byzantine tactics were, especially cavalry tactics, uh, at this point were extremely developed and extremely refined sophisticated and the Romans were, mm, let's say, um, mm, basically capable of countering also the, the, the best horse peoples that existed around there, like the Avars, like um, the Persians weren't at this point really horse riding peoples, so they had, they had extremely uh, strong and efficient calories themselves, while Rome at this time was able to counter all uh, these enemies in, into open field. Uh, with, a, with an extreme care given, in fact, to these uh, cavalry tactics, that were really started, uh, implemented, improved, and and, and always uh, um, updated. Let's say, in, in according to the needs. Mm. And this is um, uh, a moment really of glory of the uh, the Roman military, exactly for this reason, because it combined uh, the really the best of what had been the uh, the Roman tradition uh, in terms in terms of discipline of um <coughs> of order with the Hellenic. Um, um, legacy of um, you know technology of um, uh, critical thinking also of uh, ethnography so being able to re um, to to understand the the strengths and weaknesses of every single people uh, that the Romans got in contact with so that they could um, um, respond to, to to every threat uh, with with an, an effective uh, with a proper answer let's say. And, and and what you realize um, is that at this time the Byzantine um, um, cavalry specializ specializations are um, very varied, hmm? and this suggests really the um, the importance and the development of of cavalry tactics at this time. So um, there are certain um, names that even appear um, to designate certain cavalry units uh, at this time. And now we make a list essentially of what they were. Uh, so the uh, first of all, there were the certain names of these were naturally all um, um, already existing into the Roman army previously. Um, the um, the idea is um, um, the um, um, at this time the, the the Roman army still spoke Latin. 
written as a as the language of the army, but naturally there were there um, the Hellenic equivalents to such names as well, as uh, Greek was the most widespread language in 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 the Roman Empire at at this point. Um, <coughs> so giving going with the uh, these units um, uh, and their specializations, um, let's go by order. First of all, the word the cursores. Now, the cursor in Latin is the runner, basically. And uh, you see in, in Greek that it, there is this simple transliteration of the uh, Latin name, as um, it was cursores as well in, in Greek. Then, um, so as you understand, these runners were mm, sort of light cavalry that had to perform a hit and run um, tactics. Um, and, uh, and it was very flexible and probably lighter and um, it's um, the unit where probably most of the horse archers were, were present in this sense. Then the defensores, that is also in here both the Latin and Greek name, I mean the Latin name borrowed by Greek, um, so these are the defenders as you understand um, and they were usually heavier cavalry. Um, and they had a more stationary role in this sense. They, uh, I will, as we will see now with the uh, battle formations proper, uh, we, uh, they, uh, mm, they would f form the bulk of the um, of the cavalry proper. So the they were the shock cavalry and the one that, in this sense, um, uh, was required a very strong um, uh, order and that charged only um, usually at the end of the battle or at least um, they could be pretty dynamic as well telling the truth and uh, carry out multiple charges during the clash but naturally they were used very uh, very carefully and only when there was a, uh, a charge uh, essentially or to defend as the name says but the cavalry can't defend as an arm so that meant basically that they would attack and charge the enemy if they if they were being attacked uh, as well, so passing to the let's say counter attack. Then there were the encirclers, hmm? in Greek called um, I believe uperkerastai. Uh, so the name um, actually tells it all. These troops uh, encirc were meant to encircle the enemy. That. Uh, these probably were some of the um, most effective, this was really probably the, 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 the highest type of cavalry because carrying out an encirclement is something pretty, not just pretty difficult as a maneuver because it doesn't imply a straight, um, uh, you know, a straight charge towards the enemy but it, it's also very very risky because encircling the enemy also can put you in, into a condition to which you might not come back if the assault doesn't go uh, as it should then there were the flankers um, called um, if I pronounce correctly here in Greek because I have the the Greek al alphabet <laughs> name, uh, written name, so I, I'm not sure whether I am pronouncing all the uh, letters correctly, but it should be the uh, Flangiophilakes, Flangiophilakes, hmm? um, so these were instead an, another type of cavalry that um, usually assisted the, um, the, the encircles, um, um, uh, at least um, th this uh, it happened on the other side in the formation so these guys were essentially keeping busy the enemy and, and trying to outflank it uh, not necessarily to encircle it but just to keep him busy on one flank maybe uh, while the encircles uh, encirclers were uh, operating on, on the other so this thing of the flank attacks was a practically the, the whole deal of um, <laughs> you know of warfare since antiquity to to, to today I mean um, the flanks are an extremely vulnerable uh, part of the formation and they have, uh, they have always to be uh, guarded and basically if you're able to flank the enemy uh, and he, he he's not able to counter that um, you know odds are probably very gonna be very favorable to you um, for how the the battle is gonna is gonna go um, but um, here I it's interesting because um, they, they can't they could also make an act of disturbance in some way or at least committing certain 
troops, and in particular Frank, and therefore uh, obliging the enemy to use sometimes even certain reserves uh, that he could have um, um, sent a a somewhere else. Uh, hopefully where your own uh, encirclers were operating on the other side. So, um, you know, we, we don't have an extreme detailed um, um, knowledge about how eventually such battles in the 6th century, also given the nature of the sources, really worked. But from all what we can understand, these tactics were extremely um, sophisticated and they were based also on very... Uh, on very um, repeated maneuvers. Mm. This is what uh, sometimes it's difficult for modern people who, who don't have maybe uh, or people who don't were not in military history that much. I mean the idea that there is not a unique charge in a battle mm. and that fights last only a few minutes and then the two sides disengage and they keep skirmishing and then they engage after af after a while. So this is and this is repeated over and over again. So up to uh, up to the moment in which uh, one of the sides is too exhausted, it can't uh, hold the position anymore, and basically starts breaking. Uh, firstly, from from a psychological point of view, uh, before then a strictly physical one. So even these cavalry charges, and we will see it uh, later now, were not really conceived to break physically the the enemy formation with a physical impact. I mean, but rather to you know to soften them up, to weaken them up, to wear them out. And to eventually lead to the um, to the collapse, uh, and 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 in fact the 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 great big charges were usually at the end, mm -hmm. reason for which, so that when when these calories would have would have not met uh, uh, a resistance, and, and maybe the the only side of the cavalry charging was enough to make the enemy break, um, and this is very important because uh, still at this point in the sixth century, in spite. Um, the importance that cavalry had achieved, um, calories were not uh, the same calories as, say, of the uh, feudal age. Uh, they didn't have this. Um, s um, mm, they weren't capable, essentially, of uh, eliminating uh, the enemy infantry uh, uh, alone. Mm, so cavalry was still was slowly evolving towards something greater, but it wasn't. It didn't have the power and the strength to make these extremely violent shock charges. Although, we must say that um, s the Byzantines were also able to replicate some of the uh, most um, destructive, uh, let's say, some of the most powerful um, charges um, um, uh, that were possible and practical, practicable at the time that they had emulated from the peoples of the steppes that were, as a matter of fact, the uh, the peoples that had the most devastating cavalry charges that existed around there at the time. So the Byzantines were able to imitate that, so the, the heaviest uh, Byzantine cavalry at this point had you know, these um, contest uh, double-handed uh, um, um, spear, essentially, that uh, it which required by way so at this time it the, the the syrups are appearing just right now telling the truth in the Byzantine army um, and uh, the 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 horses are really not so stable even given their uh, uh, their um, uh, their um, um, you know their, their I don't know how to say that. Uh, they weren't stable because their, uh, f let's say, fit gear, I don't know how to say that, in, in a different way, wasn't still so um, m m uh, evolved for for m remaining um, adherent, let's say, to the terrain during uh, a very sh um, strong uh, cavalry charge. And this is what I'm trying to say, because the, the all that also that technology uh, that and zootechny because that also um, uh, that that had is important it's the type of horse mm, and how that horse is able to is is used to get trained etc um, hadn't still developed all the components that would have led eventually the uh, the, uh, the 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 heavy feudal cavalry to the feudal heavy cavalry uh, of the later centuries to to become these irresistible, uh, shocking 
um, uh, uh, shock cavalry. Um, but, however, still cavalry charges charges could be very powerful as well at, at this time, and especially infantries um, weren't this big much uh, at this point because. Um, the same Byzantines had put a, a, a much bigger deal of emphasis on their own cavalry at this point than on their infantry, even though still Byzantine infantry was pretty strong. So were uh, the the infantry of other peoples, but uh, very often uh, there was also a problem of manpower. Mm. Uh, sometimes uh, it was difficult even to field large bodies of infantrymen, there were logistical problems, uh, there were a few resources at this time, especially when the uh, plague, uh, the Justinian plague, struck in. So um, uh, there weren't these huge masses of extremely highly trained uh, infantrymen at this point, like it had been, I don't know, in, in in the previous centuries. So this also was a factor, and that's why cavalry was indeed so important um, at this point as well. Al it was also a matter of relative terms. Um, so um th we we stopped to the um the flankers um then there were the um uh the uh i don't know how to say this the incursors um uh i'm trying to find a better um because I, I read these things and I don't find the like an idiot uh, the, 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 the translation first. Mm -hmm. So this other unit, I, I will translate them as incursors. I know that this term doesn't exist in English but it doesn't matter because it's still a Latin name and it's plenty of English names that are just the transliteration from the Latin term. So these incursors um, then in Greek were called um, I think enedroi if I if I'm right, pronouncing it right. Um, so these were kind of um, um, it's not they weren't really raiders as you might think, but you know the idea of the incursion is more fitting here from from a strictly tactical point of view, mm -hmm. uh, because the incursion from a strategical point of view does imply imply raiding, but from a tactical point of view, it, this means more to to exploit the gaps that. Um, that are formed within um, the, the enemy uh, line of battle. Mm -hmm. So these were um, essentially, um, also these were pretty shock, um, the tiny bodies of shock cavalry essentially that were conceived to really bre break through the, the enemy lines where, where, where a gap was. Processed. So these were probably also very um, not very light troops, um, but still mobile enough to launch these um, lightning attacks into into the enemy lines when when their, their formation was was breaking. So this is very important because it, it's as if it gives you the ma the physical dimension of how you know um, progressive and um, and very. Mm, mm, Labor laborious um, and strenuous were was the process through which the the enemy formation was um, made uh, breaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a, a tiny bits, mm -hmm. sometimes even with these continuous harassments of of skirmishers, and then um, so combined tactics with um, 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 projectile fire and then charges and everything. Um, carried out uh, on and on and on until the enemy didn't get exhausted uh, uh, psycho psycho physically. Then there were the uh, drungi in Latin, um, drungoi in in Greek. Uh, that were another type of cavalry uh, still. Uh, we'll see it a bit later. Um, that were conceived basically to make a charge en masse. Uh, without actually a particular order, mm -hmm. uh, this might seem sound strange, especially for for an army that definitely had such highly trained cavalry. But that that was important as well because when um, the enemy was about to break, sending in this uh, very large bodies of cavalry, this uh, that didn't have uh, an order, but in this sense could could charge really even at gallop because that's a, another point that if you are in formation, you cannot. Um, go in full gallop mm, because you break 
the order. Um, just maybe the last 100 meters if you are particularly nervous, but this was a, actually a great concern. The more uh, the more trained and the more professional the calorie was in the last it, it charged actually um, this calorie is charged at canter that is a, sen uh, a pace that goes between gal gallop and and um, and, uh, and 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 trot so we're talking about something like 40 45 kilometers uh, per hour um, um, which is enough really you know if you go in a motorcycle it, you 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 feel it really physically with the air around you. You, you understand that forty uh, is hitting at an enemy at forty kilometers is already something suicidal, really. At one point, and that's the reason why um, actually calorie charges were most faints because uh, they were aimed only at breaking an enemy that would would break before the actual impact. Because otherwise, uh, even you as a calorieman and also the horse, by the way, who stops in front of, of a, a solid obstacle would have um, would get pretty heavily damaged in in the process as, as well so the drungoi were conceived to be this mass of uh, disordered mass of troops that however was uh, extremely effective from a psychological point of view or or, or an over um, uh, was deadly from a psychological point of view on an already exhausted formation and this drungoi actually were imi imitating the um, the the ca uh, say the calorie tactics of certain peoples, chiefly the Germanic ones, who seemingly didn't have a good order in, in cavalry at this time, this is important to remember, because the individual Germanic cavalrymen, as we said before, were, were extremely skilled, probably even more than the Byzantine soldier, but um, it didn't have a collective training, or at least it was very arduous to make these uh, clans to, to stick together and to have a... Um, um, let's say a discipline and for me also because they were all, all very competitive the one against each other so normally um, it was a sort of race more than an ordered charge to see who would arrive first uh, attacking the enemy but nevertheless since especially the Germanic people so the, of the East like the Goths and the Longobards had um, especially large body of calorymen um, they tended to, to exploit this mass and and the the speed to actually uh make break the enemy at the only side of the of the charge so um disregarding order but still being pretty effective and so the byzantines acquire also these and learn in from, from this point of view also these tactics from the enemies and so these uh, naturally there were also other uh, tactical uh, uh other types of of calorymen that here I uh, have not listed but just for telling you how variegated the tactical options of the uh, Byzantine cavalry was and how much it could be uh, flexibly adapted to every tactical scenario situation and, and foe um, and, and and how complex by the way were uh, was the interaction between these uh, these units on the field that is what we're gonna see today. Excuse me, I drink a little once again. So there is also one one thing to point out um, from a more historicistic point of view. That is the fact that, uh, as was hinting at before, the Romans uh, um, hadn't been up to this point a, a great deal of um, of cavalrymen. Um, cavalry, as we said, has always been important into the Roman army, but at this point in the sixth century, um, cavalry is sort of taking over mm, for the aforementioned reasons in, in in some, at least in numbers, and but also in, in 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 if not in numbers proper, but at least in the actual, you know, the cavalry starts to take the leading role in the army mm, uh, in in some way. And and this uh, had obviously it, mm, uh, it was a process which stemmed from centuries of experience, also uh, uh, against um, these very skilled uh, horse riding peoples. So uh, it was uh, a long process that took to um, uh, to this point, uh, but uh, it was extremely uh, Byzantine cavalry was extremely effective exactly because of this learned 
lessons. Mm. So it was something that wasn't built out of scratch, like the Romans had done, for instance, uh, at the beginning with the, their own cataphract cavalry that, in fact, they they couldn't use pretty well. Uh, it, it was created just to imitate certain other cavalries from certain feudal wars, like the Persian one, that the Romans really didn't have. At this point, instead, the Romans have really absorbed uh, uh, literally even certain ethnical components um, within their army they uh, they have uh, observed them they have uh, been able to replicate those tactics in a functional way mm -hmm. so it, it's really um, it was really the best um, uh, way to um, um, uh, uh, you know that that's the most effective way to 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 learn um, and, and and this is the great at this point the great ability of the Byzantines that have this extremely open uh, mindset mm. they're not like at, at the end of their history where they concentrated in their tradition they s kind of sclerotized this time they were extremely f full, fully functional fully um, f um, capable of understanding everything and that's where their superiority stemmed from, from also from their intellectual superiority uh, that definitely can be a double-edged weapon, but at this time, the Byzantines had the an antidote for the negative, let's say from the backside of this, um, because they they could compensate this mm -hmm. uh, with the Roman legacy and the Greek legacy, um, and they knew how to to really stay open, stay equilibrated, and always being open to learning, um, and that's how basically uh, Constantinople managed to survive for centuries against let's say uh, these avalanches of peoples coming from everywhere trying to to conquer the empire and and and, and with very limited resources being able to to fence these peoples off so the first class quality uh, of their army was uh, really the process of a broader cultural development that made really the Roman Empire unique at this point um, and the greatest experience uh, against, uh, especially that had brought to such great uh, development of cavalry tactics, had been the ones definitely against the Huns and against the Avars. So the horse uh, riding peoples, pro excellence at this point, um, at least th that the uh, the Byzantines uh, fought intensively uh, against, and uh, from which, uh, as we were saying before, they were also able to absorb um, certain. I mean to hire mercenaries from and to to integrate uh, certain elements into their army. Um, so um, in this process, the um, the Byzantines had learned also, um, let's say, a lot of to, to be extremely cautious. I mean, not to think at calorie as um, this um, bravadery um, unit that had just to charge straight and uh, you know behaving like uh, uh, in a fully uh, say loyal way this is also very important from from a historical point of view uh, because um, there was an indo-european matrix I even into the greek and into the roman world that had kind of pushed for this um, mindset of frontal attack mm. I mean he, um, war has always been a very dirty uh, business mm. uh, um, there, al there have always been ideals uh, moral ideals of how to fight a right war for instance or how to behave um, loyally uh, on the field so um, up, up to this point the Europe had remained a bit like that. I mean, all the armies were mostly conceived to to attack frontally, to have a, a direct um, attack, etc. By meeting the the peoples of the steppes, there, um, and also partly naturally the Persians um, on in, in in the east, uh, the Romans learned to be a bit more sneaky, mm? and uh, in this sense, a bit more intelligent. Which which is not something, in fact, so bad. I mean, for us today. Um, we don't see, you know, uh, anything bad in making an ambush and uh, uh, and killing the enemy in that way. Um, at the time, there were certain, you can argue still today in part, ideally, you know, that that 
m you know, not facing the enemy, not beating the enemy face to face, but recurring to these tricks was kind of a of an infamy uh, in part from from the Indo-European edus that was based really on even in, on the individual fight uh, with equal weapons and all. Um, so this has a bit remained. This is, this would be particularly. Uh, you know, we can see that also from from feudal warfare by, by in, in the Middle Ages, uh, but we can see always that besides the ideals, um, uh, these kind of tactics of feints, of ambushes, and stuff like that have always existed, mm? and that the the literary models were maybe more attached to this idealism, but the practice of warfare has always been very very sneaky indeed. But wh what I'm trying to say is that there was a cultural process also in here. So the the Romans changed a bit their mind. They learned from the Huns and the others that certain tactics, hit and run tactics, um, uh, feint fights, uh, flights, um, uh, the um, uh, the ambushes and and these other cunning movements, etc., were were very profitable. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they, uh, the Romans learned to, to replicate these tactics, they immediately used them. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's and and that's civilization, if you allow me this reflection, because um, this doesn't mean to play unloyal, because even to carry out those tactics require a big deal of ability, mm -hmm. a big deal of training, especially, and. Um, and and it's uh, it's very important that a people is able to replicate these tactics successfully, and especially as successfully as the Byzantines were doing uh, at this point. So uh, you have to imagine this experience to be learned uh, also in the very hard way through battles and uh, and defeats as well. Um, so um, these um, these canning behaviors kind of begin uh, begin to be a um, sort of of um, a general rule mm, um, uh, of behavior and they become to characterize Roman warfare uh, at this point uh, by itself in fact when uh, for instance the the Carolingians or the Ottonians or the Germans in general fought against the uh, the Byzantines they um and they were defeated uh several times as much as actually also the Byzantines were partly defeated they 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 wanted to stress this idea that the Greeks as they called them by uh you know with contempt so f stressing that they were not Romans uh, as by the way the Germans thought that uh, in the west they had taken the place of the Romans proper uh, uh, by right of arms, that they were the Greeks were in this sense sneaky and cunning, and you could you could not trust them, and and this is uh, naturally a cliche that uh, really reflects, however, how sophisticated and how um, um, and and not just at a tactical level the Byzantine army was. Here we're talking also about diplomacy. Uh, we're talking about uh, secret services. We're talking about this. A necessary pragmatism that brought the Byzantines to be um, that in order to for them to survive uh, to all the, the the peoples that attacked them continuously to act pretty sneakily you know to to basically uh, exploit every opportunity to uh, obtain uh, the uh, uh, the, be the maximum of the results so this was uh, let's say uh, criticized uh, in part from the Germans that instead were not so cunning definitely they were ex extremely courageous and this is what also the Byzantines stressed um, but they weren't capable of, of carrying out those comp overly complicated tactics that the Byzantines could simply because they didn't have the same level of a collective training I, I stress this very much because it, war is all about collective training mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, in the same strategicon, or strategicon as you want to say that, um, you you realize this that the Byzantines themselves, when they arrive on the chapter on the so-called blonde-haired peoples that were the, the the Germans broadly meant, 
um, and I, I made a video about this. Uh, it's in the migration era period, also in the um, migration era playlist. Sorry, and um, in the um, also in the Longobird history playlist. Yes, um, you notice that the Byzantines were saying that the Germans were the most courageous of all the barbarians, but they they were essentially. Um, you know they were deeming them being lazy in a certain sense because they they didn't prepare a good um they, they weren't good at, at logistics they didn't carry out these complicated tactics um uh, and they relied chiefly only on their uh the power of their charges uh, uh immediately and, and that's also something natural because if you have a society that is not centralized it cannot provide f supplies and all uh, your army has necessarily to rely on this very limited performance so putting all the forces in this uh, extremely uh, powerful charges and hoping that that would be enough and sometimes it was enough mm? because German cavalry in this sense could, and, and also infantry could be very very effective and the Romans had um, uh, had troubles in containing uh, this population for how still relatively primitive uh, it was Excuse me, I drink a little once again. So, <coughs> the um, if you read uh, the Byzantine manuals, you realize that these uh, general rules of behavior based on sneaky tactics, etc., were uh, repeated uh, continuously to the reader. Mm. Uh, so already by the time of the uh, Vandalic War in 530, um, um, it, it's, be it's observed that the practice of deploying systematically on at least two lines, uh, with the uh, second line that worked uh, not just um, as a support and aid uh, in the case uh, of the first um, uh, meeting uh, very heavy uh, pressure, but but also. Uh, acting as a reserve to, from which to, to draw uh, during the case of battle is something that appears continuously. Mm -hmm. So the idea that there is not just a battle line, there is um, a continuous um, uh, support uh, between the, the various uh, tactical uh, units of, of the army is um, is always out there. It's not, um, you know, th these Byzantine tactics were uh, very complex uh, always at the time and they were aimed at maximizing the effect of the interaction of the various uh, 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 tactical components. Um, there was also a, lot, a, a, a great deal of attention in the Byzantine manuals uh, given to the um, say measures of counter information mm -hmm. so either simulation or dissimulation so the idea of tricking the enemy in some way, um, which included involved also a lot of um, psychological warfare. Mm. Uh, remember, then in a battle, uh, what you aim at is not the physical destruction of your enemy, uh, but rather uh, the collapse of his moral resources. Mm. Then, when he, his moral resources are collapsed, he's fleeing, and you can kill him physically. But during the battle, in fact, during the battles proper, during the combats proper, there weren't such big deal of 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 dead of kills uh, it was rather after the battle that in, in the following pursuit that uh, the major uh, the slaughter occurred but um, during combat everything was really based on mostly on this psychological effect you could carry out on the enemy to to throw him uh, in despair and to uh, to get rid of him uh, through that and um the even if even if the, for instance the distances between the um the lines of battle were recommended um were adjusted let's say according to the necessity to engage the enemy and to engage battle only when um the the enemy is not able to carry out um um effective countermeasures mm. so that the battle lines worked in a way that was also minding what how the enemy was behaving mm. 
and this is important because sometimes it was a matter of really of uh, of space. We will see now how even the distances uh, between the ranks were all prescribed in a particular fashion. So this gives you the dimension of how the level of training of this army was, because these are not things that you can do with someone who was never, you know, who maybe is a good warrior but has never had a, you know, has never trained with all the rest of the army. These are things that you can do only with an army that repeats uh, repeated this in training over and over again. Uh, and the Byzantines were at the top for that. And that's why, by the way, the enemy was so impressed by this, because sometimes you can't impress someone just by showing off. Mm -hmm. A big deal of warfare, psychological warfare, is based on this. I mean, um, I was talking about that the other day for, for the Battle of Mammes, uh, when the Moors were frightened at the only uh, sight of the, uh, the Roman uh, formation for how ordered it was. Mm -hmm. Because you have to think that b by this time, uh, objectively, the armies that could feel such ordered, um, I mean, the peoples that could feel such ordered armies were really a few. I mean, it was not normal to have an army that was so perfectly lined up and uh, and um, working on all together and um, and uh, remain ordered and all. It, it's you know, it was also a matter of saying, "Oh my God, look look at those! They all work like one." That's f uh, probably one of the most frightening things of all uh, in in warfare, I must say. And that's what you know. Um, that's not enough to give you, uh, you know, a uh, a decisive edge, because uh, especially at this time, there weren't there wasn't a big deal of um, let's say asymmetry. Uh, you, you know. Yeah, these people's all were could be very very different um, culturally speaking, but the technological potential was pretty. You know, the technological gap was v minimal practically. You can't even. You know, if you see, as I say before, a, a Byzantine Caballarius or uh, a Longobard Arimanus, uh, probably aside from certain insignia and all or colors, you could have not really told the difference. Who was who? It was a big deal of homogeneity uh, at this point. So, um, this is why probably such, um, I mean, not probably, but I'd say obviously why uh, the order and the discipline really could make the difference because that was really what what made the difference uh, at, a, a, at a much bigger level, not just at a tactical one, but also as a civilization in practice. So r you have to imagine the Roman Empire at this point being still, uh, for instance, a state, a real state. Uh, there was nothing like that out there. Um, the rest of Europe now were uh, Latin uh, Germanic kingdoms that had that there were sort of domain, big dominions. There was a very few deal of centralization. Um, uh, it was difficult to organize even an army and all. There was a lot of also political negotiation because um, there wasn't really a, a central recognized ruler sometimes. The Byzantine state instead relied on uh, a bureaucracy, a permanent army, a professional army, uh, with a society that in this sense was all versed towards uh, um, re the revolt uh, actually around uh, the armed forces mm? because the major expenses at that time of actually of all of all mm, societies were about the military ones mm? at this time the, the civil investments were a very uh, a very few usually it was the, the local communities would took care of it by themselves at this time by the way there weren't many resources in the first place so the only ones that were ca collected were for the army, essentially, so this uh, was also shaping society in a certain way, um, uh, and also in the Byzantine Empire, telling you there is a bit of decentralization at this point. If you think about the the Bucellari army, we we haven't discussed that, but today we stick to battle formations, so maybe that will um, will do for another video. 
So and there is also another mm, there is also a big deal of of emphasis uh, placed in Byzantine uh, military manuals for the creation of any kind of a physical obstacle, mm. uh, even especially when concealed, um, for the uh, for countering the enemy cavalry. Now this is also very interesting, um, which tells you. So we're talking about ditches. Um, holes, um, caltrops, so all traps essentially that um, were carried out by the Byzantines uh, with an extremely, extremely natural uh, uh, way, uh, extremely um, um <laughs> with with um, very nonchalant behavior and and, and great tactical refinement, uh, by the way. So this was normal. It was kind of the standard you could expect from from the Byzantines in this sense. So what um, this is interesting because it was aimed at countering enemy cavalry as well. So this tells you also how frequently the Byzantines were meeting other uh, cavalries in in battle, uh, and um, and how, of course, uh, relatively to field fortifications, how um the Roman Empire was still at, at the top really for its Roman legacy in, in military engineering that was the, the most advanced and that um had been extremely refined. Naturally, yeah, that came also from the Hellenistic world actually. The Romans learned um much of their uh military engineering for the same Greeks. So there was this actually mixed um uh, legacy that was, uh, however, perfection and was drawing the best from from every from every um, from every source. So uh, naturally, there was um, also a big deal of emphasis placed on the close and open order. So the uh, open order was called in Greek uh, arayos pe peripatos or peripatos. I don't remember how it's in Greek. And um, so, in, in in open order, um, the um, there was a big deal of things you could do compared to close order. Mm -hmm. The close order is mostly meant to charge and to keep you know information um, uh, compact. But wi with an open order, you could do a big deal of other things um, because uh, in open order, the calorie man can. Uh, in every moment, uh, are in every moment put in the condition of making the uh, horse turn and to invert the direction of march. Uh, this is very important because, especially for for the uh, cursores that we have seen, uh, this meant that you could arrive uh, up to the enemy lines, uh, also running. By the way, because close order uh, gives you more um, space. Let's say w when you are at gallop, you. you the cow, uh, the the cal uh, cavalry uh, tends to, as we say, to, to get disordered. But with close order, the uh, the open order, the horse has more, um, can run more freely in in this sense as well, and has the space of maneuver for arriving at the enemy, running, throwing, uh, letting the the uh, the cavalrymen throwing missiles at the enemy, and then turning around and and running back, all very fast. So in, in this case, the spaces that were prescribed to maintain between um, uh, calorymen and other uh, were, um, say, um, about two meters um, um, in si in in uh, inside, and, and and not less than four meters and a half between a file, uh, a line, and another. Mm -hmm. um, so this meant, yeah that um, between um, there was enough space really to make the horse turn and, and do it. It's not an excessively open formation. Um, probably uh, this also requires a certain order of sorts. It's not like a completely scattered formation. Um, but it's enough to, to make the horse performing certain maneuvers. Also in here the maintaining the, the calorie um, I say ma maintaining order even in an open formation is very very important because um, 
especially with the effect that you can make on the enemy. Not just psychologically, but also trying to maybe um, to to maintain your fire, your your uh, your fire, let's say, concentrated, more um, you know, uh, more homogeneously concentrated on one side of the enemy formation, not dispersing, let's say, the the uh, the concentration of, of fire. That is important because, especially as we have seen, if you want to weaken uh, a specific side of the army where where you want to eventually um, charge into. Uh, that's uh, that's important, and those are resources that you want to save because, uh, I mean, these these cal uh, Byzantine cavalrymen were extremely skilled, but also making back and forth multiple times has a has a toll, mm, has a cost. Um, so you can do that multiple times if you are an extremely skilled horseman, but then you might be very very tired. Your horse also is going to be very very tired, so. Um, um, when you carry that out, it's important to maximize also the effects of your um, uh, your tactics and to try to uh, to to weaken the enemy accordingly. Not just saying, "Okay, I made three or four times back and forth," but I actually carried, uh, I actually damaged the enemy the way I wanted to, and I didn't disperse energies, arrows, and and other. And I also suffered less tactics because the enemy was not uh, uh, less casualties. Sorry, because the enemy was not there just being shot at. They would throw uh, else at you, so that was a continuous risk as well. There were always uh, some casualties uh, of sorts. Um, there was a lot of arrow fire all, all around there. Uh, um, uh, think about fighting against the Hans or the others. Uh, certain tactics are basically gonna have have um, gonna produce losses from both sides mm -hmm. even the Germans at this point had horse archers especially the, the Eastern Germans had so um, as we were saying the Byzantines were also meeting foes that more or less already fought in that way too so it was a very valid way to, to counter the enemy now of course the Byzantines also had other infantry components archers mostly um, also Germans had lots of foot archers so you see here it's it's not a big deal of difference of what kind of tactics they were performed but really the order in which they were performed that eventually was crucial as a difference so the close order could be um, adopted also during the marches in, in some sort um, it was preferred for a fast attack, as we've seen, but also um, in pursuing the enemy. Um, because in this sense you can cover a, a wider area. Mm -hmm. So m it, it, you, you have a, a broader net into which the enemy can, can fall. And uh, the... Um, and and especially if the uh, this the close or the the open order was used also if for some other reason usually a desperate one or at least uh, something that didn't require lots of order the cavalrymen need to go at gallop. Uh, that as we were saying before, it's it's a pace that requires much more space around the animals in order to avoid contacts and collisions between one or the other that could lead to certain accidents and that's pretty risky because also horses run pretty fast um, so um, the naturally the disadvantage of open order consisted in the unavoidable breaking of the formation on the long run mm -hmm. uh, because um, the horses weren't um, were less um, uh, you know they didn't have a lot of reference points uh, you know the, the, the wider the, f the formation is uh, the more the horse is more likely to go at a different speed than the other so that is the kind of you know uh, now I'm, I'm stressing very much the concept of order uh, but you have to think that after 
you know, a fight starts, etc., the order kind of loses it. Um, it doesn't mean that um, there is a sort of, you know, single combat thing. Uh, that's just Hollywood. Uh, uh, the melee, the totally chaotic melee, as we've seen in all, the, uh, it's just in movies. It never existed in the history of warfare. Um, the, the, the humans always fight in two groups more or less certain types of formation but it's still very very important how that formation is ordered internally speaking because the functionality of a formation is based necessarily on how the men are disposed within there um, um, formations are meant even to have a sort of direction changing front is a hell of a problem because uh, men are disposed internally into their formation in a way that uh, also has to do with how one relies on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, the, the leaders, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the guys in the front line are the ones who have more experience, who know how to remain more information. So the, the the one of the of the uh, of uh, of the lower ranks tend just to follow them. So um, when something gets disordered. Uh, there are casualties, there is chaos, etc. Uh, you can still st stick information like humans instinctively do when they are in, in they feel threatened in, and in danger, but the, the formation is, is gonna uh, sink in its functionality. It's just a bunch of men that uh, stick together and cannot perform. So a great deal of this order was naturally uh, put into the... Um, oops... <laughs> made collapsing my my microphone um, the, a, a big deal of the um, of the um, order it was placed on the formation proper mm -hmm. on the deployment before the battle because that's what actually makes um, the army effective you know um, the the preset formation because a, a big deal of um, of emphasis, uh, I mean, all the the emphasis placed on order is essentially this: that you already know that during the battle you're gonna lose it. So the more your um, why so much importance placed on on deployments because those were essentially the the mold, the the base, the, the, the from which the whole battle would have evolved, and generally speaking, the the major tactical bodies of the army didn't really make, didn't really carry out such complicated tactics. It was more about the smaller units that were in the sense more um, more interacting and uh, but the, the, the co complexive order deformation is something you have to keep generally f um, uh, in, in, in shape in order to maneuver the main tactical bodies. So uh, these deployments were conceived evidently at trying to see, uh, you know, to have always certain reserves. For instance, the idea that there were always two lines, as we've seen, is crucial because um, that implied a, con a constant need for, for a reserve that could support uh, the, ba uh, the, m the first line of battle during the fight. And uh, and this is something that naturally was um, uh, very um, very functional, as you understand. But it also required the cooperation, the coordination between the two bodies. So, uh, a principle, of a classical principle of war is simplicity. Here it seems that it's not being met, but telling the truth, it, it's built of this halfway. Mm -hmm. It's maximizing the simplicity. Leaving, uh, let's say, uh, it's a compromi compromise between the simplicity, with the functionality, uh, let's say, the uh, leaving open certain tactical options, hoping that the enemy can't. Mm -hmm. So this was also naturally aimed at always countering the possible enemy um, actions. Um, so giving a bit of reserve y of resources in some sort to be able to to be ready to meet the enemy on and this is also very theoretical telling the truth because military manuals are naturally very 
schematic. Uh, sixth century Byzantine manuals have all this uh, the idea of a of fixed tactical models that sometimes you have also to use against this or that enemy, but let's say practice was probably a bit different and, and not less um, sophisticated, but probably a bit more functional, a bit more pragmatic, and, and this pragmatism probably implied also a greater simplicity than what it's showed um, in the manuals proper, but this is just speculation and now it's uh, mostly, I don't like uh, speculations much. But, um, the uh, as we were saying before for the Drungoi, um, sometimes this uh, open order could, and, and consequently this opportunity of, uh, of charging the enemy at gallop was could be um, could be exploited in the uh, final phase of, of an advance in close order, mm -hmm. uh, if uh, especially when the enemy when y when you realize that the enemy was giving signs of um, it was about to collapse. So as we were saying before, yeah, you can keep close order to basically scare the enemy to say, okay, how do we meet this? I mean, the concept of close order is that given a certain length of the battle line you have more enemies it's by sticking together can uh, carry out a greater um, uh, uh, can exercise a greater force o on that on that line um, uh, if the enemy is about to collapse or is already fleeing well, at that point, you can advance in close order to scare him, and as soon as you understand that they're fleeing, you can launch, launch into full gallop, and therefore um, really already starting the pursuit, so not even needing to impact against something solid in the first place. Um, so this could be also an option. Um, so the the close or passing to the close order instead the, in, in in Greek it was called sphixis. So this is the um, the order that the uh, cavalrymen, ha um, cavalry formations had when they needed to um, to to get compact, mm -hmm. and especially by keeping an ordered formation, mm -hmm. not just during the marches and uh, other uh, other movements. Uh, of sort, changing position, for instance, uh, but also during, and especially during an attack. Mm -hmm. So this has always been the great deal of cavalry uh, attacks that, in order to be effective, they have to be ordered, especially cavalry charges. Um, so um, the in, in this uh, in, in this um, occasion, the distances to keep between the horses were about uh, were naturally shorter than the ones in the uh, open order so we're talking about uh, 90 centimeters uh, by side um, that is between the columns of, 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 uh, of calorie and of, of uh, 2 meters and 40 more or less uh, uh, between one line and another so you understand it's pretty pretty close mm -hmm. so it's it's a formation that doesn't allow a, a big deal of movement within mm -hmm. and that's why you can turn the horse in this without messing up the wall formation and that's why you want to use the close order when you're gonna charge straight at the enemy so this very compact mass that advances uh, and is able to, to smash what what it finds in in the front so, uh, differently from the open order that could uh, allow, as we've seen, even gallop, uh, in, in, uh, especially for the skirmishers that did back and forth from uh, between the, the two armies to, to harass uh, the opponents, um, the, uh, the, the, the pace to maintain in, in close order was trot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, just in the last 100 meters before the charge, you would go into counter, huh? so not gallop because gallop disrupts the formation. That's bad if you want to charge. Um, so the 
um, this close order was, as you understand, uh, more preferred by the defensores, so this mostly thick body of cavalrymen mm -hmm, uh, during the advance, while the cursores, the runners, were um, were um, would, could were freer in deciding whether they could go at trot, at uh, gallop. That it wasn't a big deal. Um, they could uh, they could do it as as they please. Uh, so also in here, the advance, as we said before, the advance of a of a compact formation can really scare the hell out of the enemy, uh, only uh, at at its sight, mm -hmm. and um, the. Um, so the the idea was to make the enemy break before the impact, as we said before. So, in fact, this is also another prejudice a bit uh, relatively to the idea that these calorie uh, in calories in history impacted frontally one against the other, mm. like in video games. Um, this is not really what happened. Uh, what happens first of all. I mean, the frontal clashes against, especially big masses of cavalry, were extremely unlikely to happen in military history. They could happen. I mean, this this is true, but that also equates to lose a big deal of potential because when um, both men and ho especially horses tend to to stop in front of an obstacle. So as I was saying before go in motorcycles 40-45 kilometers per hour that is the the speed um, uh, these guys uh, charged um, and tell me if you want to hit even uh, a steel obstacle you're gonna destroy yourself now just imagine there is someone from the other side who's gonna do your same speed that means that you basically it's as if you you had to impact against a fixed uh, an idling obstacle at um, 80 or 90 kilometers per hour, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So this never happened in history. Uh, single horses could ch charge one another, but at, at much lower speeds. And we know that there were terrible impacts, especially at this time, considering that the syrup was not; uh, it was just mm, popping out essentially, because the Byzantines seemingly took it from the others, uh, not even from the east. Uh, the Persians were getting it from the Huns now, uh, the White Huns. Um, but uh, in fact, Procopius, when he talks about the uh, very frequent cavalry clashes between the Byzantines and the Goths into Italy during the sixth century, he states that were lots of broken bones and and wars um, because of the lack of steer, uh, because there was no other way to to stay on horseback. So you have to think that yeah. Horses can also be pretty aggressive. The horses are very active animals. They can punch the enemy. They can bite the enemy. Um, war horses do these things, and so they also can 